growing body of psychological research is focused on concepts of well-being, life satisfaction, and workaholism. In his book, Yesse Professor Stephen Pullmans considers how the research in this field has evolved, and he analyzes some of the key factors related to workplace psychological health. I think over the last uh, five to ten years we've come to the realization in, in general that the, the modern diseases are no longer related with uh, bacteria and viruses. Um, the most important reasons uh, of, of, of death in the human population nowadays are related with um, work habits or lifestyle habits in general, right? the way we do things. Um, the number one and two reasons are um, coronary heart disease and uh, accidents. In the same way in the workplace, um, if we look at the number one and two reasons for absenteeism or for uh, disease in the workplace are back pain and stress. And even in the case of back pain, you can imagine they're very much uh, not only related with ergonomics and the way you sit uh, in front of your office, but also with uh, the toil and the pressure of every day. The second reason is that uh, an interesting anecdote is that one of the fastest growing fields in science in general, so I include all possible sciences you can imagine, has been occupational health psychology. And what this indicates, I think, is um, we are more and more realizing how important this is, not only for well-being and health, which is uh, a major concern, but also for productivity. So this might uh, sound a bit counterintuitive, because obviously by having more money, you can afford better health insurance and better doctors, and, or have better food and, and, and circumstances. So you would say that uh, salary or money is related with health, but it, it hardly isn't. It, uh, the correlations are very low. What does seem to make uh, a whole difference is, is the way you work, right? And, and the way you see the world more in general. There are basically three factors that uh, influence happiness in general, well-being in general. The first factor is a pleasant life. Right? And here, obviously, having a, a job that is uh, interesting or having a, a satisfying relationship uh, can be helpful. But it's, it's a temporary or it can be a temporary thing. Right? As soon as a conflict uh, emerges, uh, this satisfaction, um, which is a temporary state, can, can disappear. What seems to be more stable is um, it has to do with an engaged life and with a meaningful life. Engaged means that you have a job or outside of your job you have some type of, um, of activity that you enjoy thoroughly um, and that is linked in some way with the strengths or the talents you have. And the third factor is a meaningful life. Right? Above and beyond um, having a job that's, that's interesting to you is working for a company or doing a job that gives meaning to your life. Right? Um, it was uh, Nietzsche who said, he, he who can, uh, has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Right? So if you have a meaningful life, uh, you are better capable of tolerating uh, things that go against you, um, unexpected events that, that can disturb this, this equilibrium. Now it is absolutely clear I think advances in, in science have, have clearly demonstrated the link between physical and psychological uh, well-being. I think one of the best cases to illustrate that is coronary heart disease, the number two uh, cause of, of death in the world. Um, one of the risk factors for coronary heart disease, for heart attacks, is, uh, is identified as type A behavior, and more specifically within type A behavior, which is a behavioral pattern, is hostility, is, is being or having uh, some type of hostility towards your environment, being impatient, being easily inflammable, uh, getting angry quickly with incompetence or slow people around you. Right? 
this hostility has, uh, through longitudinal research, been identified as a separate risk factor for, for coronary heart disease. So there we see clear uh, illustration of how psychological well-being and physical well-being are related with each other. Some people, for instance, some researchers define it uh, using as a criterion the number of hours worked. Um, I don't agree. Right? We found in our own research that um, you can work very long hours, but still uh, have a very satisfied uh, life and, and feel very well. So what's going on there? Well, the thing is the way you work. And so that's what seems to characterize uh, work addiction is um, a lack of control. It's almost like an obsession the incapacity not to work. The other uh, indicator is, um, is exactly uh, the fact that you don't really enjoy it. Right? Um, uh, it's an addiction. Right? It's something it's, that's unavoidable and, and you feel guilty about it, you feel bad about it, but you can't seem to stop it. Right? Um, very often we, we, we can uh, identify an addiction by the way of identifying what we call abstinence symptoms, which are the things that you show, the behavior you show, when you cannot do this thing or you cannot use this drug. Right? In the case of work addiction, um, if, if you become nervous, um, short-tempered when you cannot work, or if you react in a very um, nervous or agitated or even aggressive way when people criticize you for the fact that you work very hard, Maybe that's also a sign of, of work addiction. Um, and whatever way we, we take a look at it, um, for me the ultimate uh, proof of work addiction is if working hard starts damaging your environment and you're not aware of it or you don't care. Basically this is a, a person characterized by uh, pressures in the environment that force this person to work very hard, but he would rather or she would rather not work so hard, and, in, and he or she certainly doesn't enjoy it. Right? Um, we, can, we have seen examples of that in, in the recent case of France Telecom, where in a, in a, in a question of uh, a little bit over a year, we had about 20 suicides. And so we have a combination here of people who are being used as pieces of chess without consulting them, who have to do a job they're not prepared for, um, and, and basically who have to accept the situation, although it causes them suffering every day because of the, 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 the situation in the labor markets where they don't really have an option to switch jobs because there's high unemployment. They, they wouldn't be able to find a new job. Right? If on top of that you're stationed uh, on the other side of the country, you really have a complete sense of loss of control. And this has been identified as a lethal factor. Can this uh, phenomena spread more? I think it, it can spread more if we keep on doing things we should not be doing, which is uh, uh, respecting a leadership style which is based on autocratic leadership uh, that doesn't take into account in any way uh, the human being that we have in front of us. Right? And that's exactly what we try to do here at the ESA Business School, is to prepare leaders that do take into account the, 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 the worker, not just as a worker, but as a human being. It's a leadership style based, first of all, on understanding uh, truly the collaborator you're working with. Right? above and beyond the worker, right? seeing the person as a whole person who also has a family outside of work, um, who has ambitions and goals and, and desires. Right? Um, second, it's a management style, a leadership style based on developing people and, and going beyond setting out objectives, checking whether the objectives have been reached or not, and punishing or rewarding people based on whether or not they uh, achieve their objectives. Uh, it's about asking the question, how can I help you to develop the competencies that are needed? Right? Not only to reach your objectives, 
but also uh, to be more efficient and a more uh, satisfied person in the workplace. We have seen that uh, for a longer time, I think the new trend now, uh, something new we, we observe, is the personalization of, of people management or dirección de personas. Um, with the realization that um, development is by definition something that happens at the individual level, not a class level. What we try to do here at the ESSE is more and more incorporate this aspect in our courses, especially in, in uh, general management programs. We not just talk about um, issues of marketing and accounting and finance and operations and logistics, but where we actually talk about, um, uh, you know, what's your purpose in life, where do you want to go, um, to what extent have you been taking care of yourself, which is a condition for taking care of other people. Um, all these issues related with, uh, with health, where we talk about issues like time management, work-life balance, stress management. Uh, I think it's necessary. Um, in Latin we say, uh, mens sano in corpore sano. And in the same way, we could say a, a healthy employee in a healthy organization. And so I think this is a, the, the place where we need to go.